let's talk about the rules and the fighting game community. I realize that's a bit of a Pandora's box, since this community does have a bit of a reputation for being a bit, let's say, aggressive from the outside looking in. But discussion about the rules and regulations that regard how we, as a fighting game community, act towards one another is starting to pick up steam again after a group of tournament organizers released a draft of a comprehensive code of conduct that's already being adopted by a number of tournaments and other organizations like the retro online arcade emulator, Fightcade. And that's literally the last time I talk about this until the end of this thing because I actually made this video so I could tell you some dumb, some real dumb stories about the rule-bending shenanigans that various fighting game players have gotten into over the last decade plus. So let's hop right into it. Please subscribe to the channel if you like this kind of stuff. We're gonna start out with a little bit of fighting game history. The event is EVO 2004. The game is Soul Calibur 2, and after a grueling tournament, two players stand among the rest. A guy named RTD and a guy named Mick. RTD makes the grand finals off of the back of his Shenhua play, and Mick rises up from the loser's bracket thanks to his Cassandra and Sophitia. So you can imagine the eyebrows that are raised when these two players, in a game for all the marbles, money, recognition, and title of EVO Grand Champion, both decide to play characters that they're just not as familiar with and proceed to put on an unusually poor performance with those characters. It's obvious from anyone who plays fighting games, they were playing different characters and they're playing with a very subpar level. Basically, they decided beforehand that they're going to split the pot. The real gamers knew that this was not for real. And you want to know the worst part about it? This entire incident was captured on national television via the Game Show Network. Dude, aren't you on the Game Show Network? Do you uh, even know it's anything GSN, about the network for games, completely different animal. And man, if you play fighting games and you wanna get mad, this is the show for you. Because not only does this boomer-ass program cover fighting games and the people who play them in the way that you think boomers think about people who play fighting games, what do you think about the lack of ladies here? You're uh, an oddity amongst the crowd because you're a girl. I still have never held a girl's hand before. I have people problems. Yeah, people, people so, problems. I don't see where that comes from at all. It doesn't help that they ended the show on the collusion-filled Soul Calibur 2 finals, casting the entire event as kind of a joke, and left before the other historic thing that happened during that very same day. Namely... I hope you can understand why watching players goof around in the finals of a tournament can be a bit insulting. Whether you're an organizer or a participant, there's a lot of effort being put in by anyone who attends these events, and leaving with a sour taste in your mouth probably isn't good for keeping these players coming back for another one. But to his credit, in a 2015 Event Hub's post about this incident, RTD says that both he and Mick both played seriously when they met in winner's finals of the tournament. But because of spectators booing their defensive play, they decided to amp up the crowd during Grand Finals with strange picks and aim their play towards entertainment rather than with intent to win. He calls it a mistake that he wouldn't have repeated if given the opportunity, but I would argue that this actually worked out for the betterment of Evo, who was forced to put in an anti-collusion rule in place because of this incident. In the words of Evo co-founder Tom Cannon, we were like, fine, this happened. Let's make sure this is never gonna happen again. <laughs> Isn't that cute? But it's wrong! Truth be told, most people actually don't care that much when it comes to the act of pot splitting. But the thing that the fighting game community faces some growing pains over here was recognizing that they weren't in Kansas anymore, and that random selecting during an official event wasn't gonna cut it. From 2009 onward, the scene was facing exponential growth, with streamers and tournament organizers sticking their reputation and their tournament's legitimacy on big-time companies who wanted to sponsor these events. All of a sudden, tens of thousands of spectators around the world wanted to see players fulfill their obligation as competitors and give it their all every single match. I say that these were growing pains because from 2010 to like 2013, it felt like there was always a decent chance that there would be at least one incident of a lackluster match at a huge event that stemmed from something like intentional underperformance, like what we saw in 2004. For example, 
the Marvel 3 finals at Power Up 2011. Oh, Justin's going Phoenix. Phoenix. And he's starting her? Are we seeing a starting Phoenix? Justin Wong is trolling everybody. And she's dead. Why? He's laughing he right now. Yeah. He's like, that was the King of Fighters 13 finals at Power Up 2012. And in 2013, matches at final round. Man, you know what? Not worth it. Since I am the people's champ, I will speak for the people. Okay. The people think this match sucks. And I am talking for them. This is no disrespect to the two players. They are obviously great gentlemen. They are. But they are not putting on a show for the final round 16 crowd. Texas Showdown. Boo. I'm just going to straight up boo. No, this is dumb. This is dumb. And the Video X Games in the Caribbean Islands. We didn't plan collusion, you know. We we didn't say we were gonna do it. We we didn't. We, it was not planned. It was not planned. It just happened. I think due to bad circumstances. This one seemed to be the tipping point where the fighting game community Illuminati finally saw enough and promised a full-on media and sponsorship blackout for any event that didn't have an anti-collusion rule. Today, this issue still pops up from time to time, especially with the open question of what happens to a player who qualifies for an event, who then registers for another tournament, where the prize is a qualification to the same event that they just qualified for. But outside of that edge case, organizers have been able to cut down on collusion at major events by flexing their muscles as tournament organizers, disqualifying players or hurting their pocketbooks by pulling prize money for any players who they believe aren't following tournament rules. Up, I will pull the motherfucking pop bonus. I will fucking do it. Do not fucking try me. Sticking with the theme of growing pains, something else that the rapid growth of the fighting game scene provided was an opportunity for more people than ever before to go full-time as professional fighting game players. There was an influx of new talent, which meant more events, which meant more money up for grabs for those good enough to win constantly. But because of a hesitance from fighting game developers and publishers to jump into the competitive scene, a general resistance to the esports outsiders who wanted to change up the more grassroots origins of the fighting game scene, and the fact that even with an explosion in growth, pro fighting games still weren't touching the popularity and reach of other genres, there simply weren't enough revenue streams for even the best of the best to make a living off of tournament results alone. And since sponsors usually stuck to providing travel and lodging costs, rarely paying out high dollar salaries to individual fighting game pros, these players had to look at different ways to pad their pocketbooks, including, but not limited to, raffling off their unused or unwanted peripherals. Fight sticks, posters, games, figurines, if you can name it, it was probably being raffled for a $5 ticket on WePay. Now that probably doesn't seem like much of a bad thing, but it was kind of everywhere. The people raffling stuff would win stuff in other raffles so they could raffle the prizes they just won off in a weird raffle human centipede, and it wasn't probably the best look to have the most visible members of your growing scene constantly asking you to buy a raffle ticket so they could try to pay off the lease to the huge house they bought in an attempt to make better FGC content. This was a hot-button topic in the fighting game community for a while, with some seeing these raffles as nothing more than just players following a dream and making their way from event to event, and others showed a little less pity, saying that raffles actively harmed the legitimacy of the scene and that those responsible should get quote-unquote real jobs. But no matter where you fell on hashtag rafflegate, you could rest assured that there was at least one Batverse parody Twitter account that reflected your views. There was Raffle Batman, Raffle Joker, Raffle Grundy, Raffle Bane, Raffle Police, Raffle Two-Face. It just kept going. But at the end of the day, this video is about breaking rules. And it's one thing to break a local tournament's rules, but it's a whole other thing to break federal and state laws. These raffles pretty much had to come to a screeching halt whenever Tony Cannon, the other Cannon brother who's also an Evo co-founder, practically begged the community to stop all of the raffles because holding a raffle without proper clearance is very illegal. The fear was that if an attorney general wanted to pursue a case, it'd be real easy with the neon bright trail of evidence that these players were leaving behind. 
<laughs> from what I can tell, nobody actually got charged with anything, and the fighting game community ultimately moved on from this goofy spot in its history. I just, I just really wanted to tell somebody about Raffle Batman. Lastly, I wanted to give a shout out to the fine folks at Hitbox for sending me one of their stickless arcade controllers. While playing fighting games on a keyboard isn't exactly anything new, I remember doing that back in 2003 with Teen Titans Battle Blitz, these guys did popularize this novel approach to fighting game controllers back in 2010. And as with anything new in the fighting game community, the hitbox attracted a lot of skeptics, saying that not having to deal with a traditional input method was too powerful, it made difficult moves too easy, and was against the spirit of competitive play. Even today, you'll see a comment here and there calling these things cheat boxes and walls of text and tournament rule sets determining what is and what is not allowed in these non-traditional controllers. A big reason for that is confusion about how these things handle something called SOCDs, or Simultaneous Opposite Cardinal Directions. Unlike a fight stick, stickless arcade controllers can hit multiple contradicting directions like left and right and up and down at the same time. And if you don't know why that's powerful, consider a game like Vanilla Marvel vs. Capcom 3 where pressing both the left and right directions at the same time looks like this. The game reads both inputs uninterrupted, meaning that you can block attacks in the front and back, removing a major indicator of skill from your gameplay. This oversight doesn't exist in every fighting game since most recent titles will have built-in SOCD prevention methods, but occasionally you will find games that let you block both ways, like in King of Fighters 14. This is something that you simply can't do on a fight stick and is considered by most to be an unfair advantage. This is something that the folks at Hitbox figured would be a problem, so they added software to their controller that cleaned those inputs, so hitting left and right would result in nothing. But Hitbox ain't the only players in the game. On the other side of the world, there exists a man called Gaffro, who created a controller like the Hitbox, but with one very specific difference. Whenever multiple opposite directions are pressed, Gaffro's controller will always read the most recent input. There's still only one direction being sent to the game, but because of this small difference, you can get away with some real shenanigans. Like, for example, throwing sonic booms without ever lifting your finger off of the back button. Daigo Umehara, one of the most prolific fighting gamers in history, brought the box mainstream attention back in 2019 when he made the jump to a stickless arcade stick. But the spotlight was too bright, it was considered too powerful, and the cap cops shut it down banning him from using the box at Combo Breaker of that year. Now, this next part, I'm only going to say it once if you promise not to use it to cheat. Cheating is bad, and you'll get caught and face super harsh penalties. So don't do what I'm about to say, wink wink. Okay, so you know EVO, right? The big fighting game tournament, the whole thing? Well, thanks to the Gaffro box kerfuffle, they released a rule set that basically says that every controller is legal as long as it cleans opposite direction button presses. Except for one. This bad boy, the DualShock 4, doesn't clean button presses, so you can hit left on the D-pad and tilt right on the analog stick and the controller sends both inputs to the game. So if you want to cheat for real at an event that got cancelled and then got cancelled again and is now in danger of being cancelled for a third time, all you need to do is transition to gamepad, learn how to properly use an awkward claw grip, hope that the game you're trying to cheat in doesn't clean SOCDs itself, invent time travel, change the past, and boom! You can block in both directions and throw easy sonic booms. Worth it, right? Wherever there are rules, there will always be people there to test the limits and push the boundaries. Whether you're throwing matches, conducting an illegal raffle ring, or just trying to break a game with your choice of controller, determining what is and isn't okay will always remain a moving target. Which is why I think that the Fighting Game Code of Conduct is a great first step for smaller tournament organizers to build their own conduct standards on. It'll also hopefully help bigger events react faster to the ever-changing landscape of the fighting game community to create a more inclusive FGC. I highly encourage everyone to understand what they're trying to do here and I'll link it in the description so you can read it for yourself. And that's it for this video. Big changes are coming to the channel in the near future, so if you watched all the way to the end and still haven't subscribed for whatever reason, now would be the time to do so. 
I'll be streaming on Twitch for a while after this video goes live, so feel free to follow me there. And thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs> That's what happens. I only win whenever I release videos.